Monsieur Green Thomas. Merci de bien vouloir présenter Porte Cap. In 1993, my father was elected president of Nigeria. He came with a platform that said, hope, farewell to poverty. My mother was the leader of the pro-democracy movement in Nigeria. Because of our efforts to protest the military's continued dictatorship, she was assassinated here in Lagos. Early in the morning of the 4th of June, my mother had one last appointment. Her car was ambushed. There was a gunshot to the tire so that the driver could not drive. And he turned back and he saw my mom's head like this. She had been shot through the head. After my mother was killed, I thought that it would be important to ensure that the military not win. If what they were hoping to do was to silence the voices of Nigeria's women, who were demanding change. I would make sure that my mother's voice was not made silent by even one day. And welcome everybody. That was a clip from the documentary called The Supreme Price about our next guest, Hafsat Abiola Costello. My name is Perry Peltz. I'm a documentary filmmaker and a journalist, but most of all, I'm so honored to be here to have the opportunity to talk with you, Hafsat. I want us to go back 25 years and set the stage a little bit. You were here in school. Your father had been the first democratically elected president in Nigeria in a 10-year period. So it must have seemed that life was good and things were going well. But he was never allowed to take power. He was thrown in prison. Take everybody back. How did you learn about what was going on back in Nigeria? My father was a businessman and a philanthropist. He loved people and he loved our country, Nigeria, and he wanted to serve. He ran for office. and. We were stunned because we're from the southwest of the country, and to win that election, you would have needed to win the north. We didn't think that the north would vote for somebody from another part. The north voted for him across the southwest, uh, across the whole region, and even on the street of his opponent in the north, who was a northern candidate, they voted for my father. Because Nigerians decided that let us set aside ethnic considerations. Let us set aside with religious considerations. And let us vote for somebody that can make a difference. And they voted for my father. It was, it became, it was elected, but then the soldiers said, oh, well, if we have this man in office who is um, so wealthy, it would not be easy to control him. So they said, um, they started trying to negotiate with him that he should ignore the elections, they would give him oil blocks, they would do all of this, and he refused. But who, how can one man stand in front of 100,000 soldiers? My father said to my mom that trying to stand in front of the Nigerian army to, to defy them is like trying to stand in front of a moving train. My mom, I would have thought, would say, well, then that's suicidal, let's forget about that. But my mother said, so let us do it together. When my father was arrested and he was kept in jail, my mom, who was a high school graduate, her English wasn't very good, now stood up. She was always in front of CNN, in front of BBC, on the streets of Nigeria marching, protesting the military's continued rule in Nigeria. 
She sold properties. My, my father had never wanted her to work. She insisted on working. So she had earned some money of her own. She sold everything that she had and gave it to the oil workers union and said, go on strike to protest the military's continued rule. Because the military was only there for the billions of dollars they were getting from the oil Nigeria had, not because they were interested in the country or its people. So she said that, and the, the oil workers union went on strike for three months, the longest strike in world history by oil workers. And when that happened, the military arrested the leaders of the oil workers and found out that my mother had funded the strike. And then that put her in their, in, in their crosshairs. And they started monitoring her, threatening her. They jailed her for 24 hours and warned her that if you continue, we will have to take more drastic measures. As soon as they released her, the US sent a mission to Nigeria to find out what was going on. My mother went and spoke to that mission, and that was the final straw. After that meeting, within days, on the day that my mother was to travel out of Nigeria for my graduation at Harvard, she was, her car was ambushed and she was gunned down. When this happened, I just thought about my gentle and kind mother. And I thought, could he? I just imagined, you know, we were seven children that she had and I was her first daughter. I imagined that she would be making her journey to the other world. And she would say, huh, this is a sudden journey. Maybe I need to tell Hafsat what to do, how to carry on. Then she would say, but I don't need to tell Hafsat anything. She will know. And she would start dancing and she will go. And once I knew that my mother was fully confident that I had this situation, I had that situation. I woke I said, I turned to my siblings and I said, come, let us stand in a circle. And we stood in a circle and we held hands. And I said, let us continue the work that mommy started. From that day that she died, we did not release her for one minute. We started that work, we continued to speak. I was on CNN within hours of my mother's assassination. We were organizing marches across the United States, Canada, everywhere. The U.S. had given me asylum status, which meant I couldn't enter Nigeria. You know, you cannot go back to where you say you are in danger. But I knew that I had to be on ground. So what I would do, I would fly to Ghana and take a car and go and be organizing in Nigeria because I knew that you have to be present, you have to be on ground. And we continued to fight until 1999, when the Nigerian military finally went back to the barracks. Unfortunately, my father also died. But they died for a country that is now democratic, a country where Nigerian people are no longer under the boots of soldiers. When we have our rights, we're still fighting to make this democracy work. But that their death will make sure we'll never be in vain. Most of us who would have something as tragic and horrible as what happened to you, your father dies in prison, your mother was assassinated, would never get out of bed again, and yet you took on political activism and have done it in such an incredible and strong and powerful way. Explain to everybody what it is that you are doing and continue to do now in Nigeria and what the conditions are like right now. In Nigeria now, I'm a member of cabinet in the, one of the states of our country. It's called Ogun State. It's my parents' ancestral state and the industrial hub. I'm a special advisor to the governor on trade and investment. I used to be special advisor for the Millennium Development Goals, managing millions of dollars for uh, my state, which is for healthcare for the poorest people, education for the poorest children, water, clean water for all communities. So as I do all of the work that I do, there's a certain way in which things are done in Nigeria that produces the problems that we see. One thing that I'm clear about is that my parents did not give their lives for me to continue the way it has always been done. If there's going to be change, I must change. I must do it the way it should be done, not the way everyone else does it. So one thing I make sure about is that if there's a dollar that is to go to the poor, it goes to the poor. If there's a dollar that is to go to poor pregnant women so they can have um, safe births, it should go to the poor pregnant women. Other people across this country steal money. There's still a lot of the public funds, billions of dollars every year from Nigeria is stolen. And I think 
what are they stealing this money for so they can buy a house in Florida, so they can fly first class? No one dies flying economy. <laughs> so why would I do that? So I'm very careful to make sure that the money is used transparently. And as an example to everyone in the country, my boss, the governor, always supports me. He always says, how said you're under my protection. Because when you try to do things differently, you might come under attack. And he, he always supports me. And another thing that I do is I have an NGO that I created for my mom. It's named for her, Kudurat Initiative for Democracy, which I call KIND, because she was the kindest person. And we are always working to empower women in Nigeria. We train women for local government elections, state elections, for appointments. We're always making sure that we address gen, um, um, violence against women. We took the vagina monologues to the highly conservative society that Nigeria is. I don't know if you've seen the vagina monologues. When they start using some of the language, my mouth dropped open the first time I saw it. I was like, oh my God, what have you done? But Nigerians love it. So we take it, we raise money, we help girls who have been forced into early marriage, who have um, their bodies have been destroyed because of early marriage, we help, get, help them get treatment. We just continue to work to make sure that women can come out from the house and into the society to repair the society, because that's what my mother wanted. And you have said that women are really what is needed in the recovery of Nigeria. We now have 20% in Nigeria unemployment rate. Um, famine is predicted to be coming because of Boko Haram and the farmers that had to leave. The situation is terrible. We need women, you say, in Nigeria, women leaders. What is it that all of these people, the international community, can do to help the people of Nigeria? Let me just take a quick detour because we're really cutting down on time and I want to make sure I tell you a story. I had to drive just um, from London to Brussels with my two children. I have a 10-year-old son, Khalil, and my eight-year-old daughter, and I had to drive from London to Brussels. So my husband took us to the tunnel, then I had three hours to drive, and I was really nervous. So he took us to the tunnel, then he turned back, because he had to give a talk in England the next day. So I started driving the children, and I got to, um, we got to the tunnel, it was one hour, it was 11 p.m. at night, and my son was awake still, because he was concerned, and my car wouldn't start at 11 p.m. once we got um, to France and I had to start driving. And I said, Khalili, the car won't start. And Khalili said, oh, mommy, what will we do? And then I tried again and then the car started and we started driving and 20 minutes in at 11.20 p.m., I said, Khalili, I think I've got this so you can go to sleep. And my gentle angel went to sleep. My, my daughter was already sleeping. She slept through the tunnel. She never had any doubts that her mother was going to be on top of the situation. So when I got to Brussels and I, I parked the car at the house, my two kids woke up and said, well done, mommy. I want to say to you that in November last year, when you held your election, I was just in shock. So were we. In the, by the results <laughs> of that election. It was just... And it feels to me now, when I listened to um, Honorable Clinton speaking last, um, yesterday, I saw why she lost that election. I don't know if you also saw it. That kind of power that that woman has, clearly some people are nervous about having that kind of power express itself in politics. And that kind of accountability that she was going to be bringing to institutions, it's intimidating. So it, it feels like, to me, like the way the car wouldn't start. It was a, America stumbled, but it's okay to stumble. You're lucky because every four years you will have an election and you'll start that car again and it's going to start. And you're going to go because the whole world needs America to rise to this challenge. People all over the world are afraid of the power of women. I saw my mother and I saw that power that she had and I saw the integrity, I saw the difference that she made. I trust the power of women. And when American women trust the power of women, American women will do what we all need them to do, which is to elect a woman president in the United States of America. And you do that. And when you do that, you would have helped Nigeria. You can't imagine how much you would have helped Nigeria. The whole world was waiting with bated breath in November for you to send that clear signal. And okay, it didn't get sent. We will do it again, we'll try again. We trust you. 
and we need you to send it because the world needs power and accountability to be like twins. And then a lot of the problems that we have around the world, these problems that you're listing, problems in America with 20 million children going hungry every day, problems like this, we will, we will, we will be able to solve them because people, women and men, we've got this. But we only can get it when we allow women the freedom and the power to express themselves. I, th I think I know somebody who should run for president of Nigeria. Hafsat Abiola Costello, thank you.